thank you for joining me for today's chat on mental health awareness. Thank you for having me to So for our 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 viewers, um, just a little bit of background of who Dr. Winifred is. Hi. So I'm Dr. Winifred Chun, a resident psychiatrist, Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Yes, that's me. Now, um, <laughs> now I've read on um, through research that according to research, women who are pregnant are at an increased risk at depression, and that anywhere from 14 to 23 percent of pregnant women experience depression. Um, while an estimated 5 to 25% experience depression after they give birth, which we know as postpartum depression. What is depression? Um, how, can you, how do you define depression? And what are the different types of depression? Okay, so depression, it's a mood disorder and a mental health. And then basically we know that when we talk about mental health, it's just that part of your ability to cope with the stresses of life and then your ability to be able to function well, to make meaningful contributions in society and then also to work productively. So depression is a common mental health illness, very common like you have mentioned. And um, it's characterized by symptoms of having a low mood okay. and i just want to distinguish it from being just sad because sometimes we use it loosely and say i'm depressed but you could just be feeling sad right. okay when we talk about depression people who are depressed most of the day have low mood and for almost every day for at least two weeks they have these symptoms but then sadness can just be a reaction to something bad that has occurred, but it doesn't persist. But then depression will say, I'll put it in intense sadness, which actually persists for a while. So before we make a diagnosis of depression, we need to see certain things, not just feeling sad, not just the sad mood or the, the, the low mood that a person presents with. But then you also have people complaining of fatigue. You could also have what we term in the medical area, anhedonia, which means that things that used to interest persons, for example, somebody might enjoy watching television, but all of a sudden they are not even interested. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there are activities that brings them um, pleasure. Now they don't enjoy doing those things again. Okay. And then we also have symptoms like having feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, okay? And then there are times that they might have inappropriate guilt, okay? That you can't really pinpoint what exactly is causing this guilty feelings, right. okay? And there are other times that you might have patients presenting with forgetfulness, mm. loss of concentration, and then they might have recurrent thoughts of death and then suicide so depression for us to make a clinical diagnosis of depression we need someone to have some of these symptoms and sometimes you might have a patient having all if not all of these symptoms a lot of, of the symptoms yes so you also mentioned that what are the types of depression yes depression actually when you come you you, you might hear a doctor say that this person has a major depression or mild, moderate, or severe depression. And this depends on um, how the patient is able to function. Is there any impairment in their occupational or their social functioning? And this will help us to characterize whether the patient has a mild form of the depression, a moderate form, or a severe form. And then it also helps in the management to be given to the patient. We also have, like you mentioned, the antipartum yes. depression, 
and then the postpartum. So during the period of the pregnancy and then after pregnancy, we noticed that some patients or some women have these symptoms of depression. We also have persistent depression or you have patients who they have low mood most of the time for at least a period of two years. That's what we called the stymia. Okay. And then yes, so we have patients like that as well. And then we can also have people who have recurrent depression as well as what we also call um, bipolar. So bipolar, you're having two poles where you have the high energy, but two extremes of emotions, the high energy and then the low side, the low mood. Okay, so those are some of the types of depression that are out. Oh, wow. Um, now, during pregnancy, anti anti-depression, what are some risk factors for a woman who is suffering anti-depression? Antipartum depression. Sorry. Antipartum depression. Okay, fine. So during pregnancy, you know that there are a lot of changes that a woman goes through. Okay, but these risk factors are not so different from the general population. Okay, um, we have the biological, the psychological, and then the social risk factors as well. Okay, this. Um, when I say biological, I'm talking about like having a family history. Right. Okay, having a family history of depression. And then sometimes the women themselves might have had previous history of depression. So during the pregnancy, they are at a high risk of having this depression just because they have had um, a previous history of depression. Okay. And the other thing too is that um, depending on whether the pregnancy was intended, whether the pregnancy is wanted or not, sometimes it puts a lot of um, sort of psychological toll on them, so they might become depressed as well. Right. Also, if the support is there, is do you have family members supporting you? Do you have the, your husband supporting you during this period? All these things are not to say causative, but they are actually some of the things that are associated with having depression. Right. And so you can have um, marital issues, if there are relationship problems, then uh, the women are prone to having depression as well. And then you can also have um, violence, abuse, whether physical or sexual, all these things on the women to depression, coupled with the fact that you are going through a whole different change altogether. So someone sees the whole weight gain, right. pregnancy, and then some of the complications that are associated like the vomiting, excessive vomiting, the tiredness and all that. Sometimes if patients are not able, these women are not able to cope with these stresses, they might end up having the depression. Now, what are some signs and symptoms to look out for when it comes to antipartum depression? How can a woman start to realize, maybe I should start seeking help? What should, what, what should they look out for? Okay, so um, just like I mentioned, in the, when you're looking out for the symptoms of depression in the general population, there's no difference really. It's actually the same thing. So having a low mood, having fatigue and actually some of these symptoms if you are not careful or you may not even diagnose or, or pick this woman out because you might actually think that they are the same pregnancy issues or as a result of the pregnancy so something like having changes in your eating habits so during pregnancy there are some women actually who have difficulty or have challenges with their appetite so they might not be eating well mm -hmm. you know that but um, this is also a symptom of depression so okay. it's very important for us to differentiate and then be able to pick up this woman and then manage them before um, delivery okay. okay so just like the ones I mentioned for the general population having a sad mood right. fatigue the anhedonia that's having no pleasure and the things that they used to enjoy previously yeah. having issues with their concentration forgetfulness weight changes, poor appetite, disturb sleep, yes, disturb sleep. And like I, I was saying, sleep 
some pregnant women have challenges right. with sleep. But the same way, um, people who are depressed also have problems with their sleep. And more commonly, these people tend to wake up earlier, like two or three hours, mm. usually earlier than their normal time. So this, when somebody is pregnant, I mean, and you see all these symptoms, it's, it's, it's good to, I mean, you can say that, okay, the person is a bit depressed, so they, therefore they need to um, see a health Now, can complications during pregnancy be caused from depression? Okay, so complications during pregnancy can be caused from depression. I'll say yes, because like the symptoms that I have mentioned, if a patient or a pregnant woman has depression and so has issues with their appetite, not eating well, then you can say that at the end of the day, you wouldn't have um, enough, the right nutrition for the baby to develop. Right. So the baby can come out with low birth weight and with other complications that comes out of it. And also I mentioned that suicide or thoughts of death is one of the symptoms of um, depression. So sometimes people might attempt suicide okay? okay so depending on what medications that they might take you might have patients presenting with preterm labor okay okay that's that's one of one of the complications okay and then um also just like i was saying the issues that they have with not taking care of themselves sometimes people who are depressed they might not be taking care of themselves they don't really care about that so you might have somebody who is not interested in going for antenatal visits and all that so really the things that the doctor might be able to pick during the time of the antenatal period right and probably having a high blood pressure or high blood sugar and all that all these things will be affected so at the end of the day you miss this and then it can have um, complications that's like the, the mother can have babies who have complications because these issues weren't paid up. Now, how is one treated for depression during and after pregnancy? Depending on what we have diagnosed, whether it's mild depression, moderate or severe, we discuss with the patient. So there are patients that we just do psychotherapy Mm -hmm. where they are able to counsel the, the patients on the problems that they are going through. We have something that we call the cognitive behavioral therapy, where okay. the negative challenges that the patient has or the woman is having is challenged. And then we help the patient come out of this um, depression. Okay. So there are people that we just use the psychotherapy and then there are others that medications are given okay medications are given together with the psychotherapy and like i was saying um because of um some researches that have been done on the medications and then the effects that they have on the them the unborn baby most of the time we look at the benefits against the risk and then discuss with the patients and then give the appropriate management and then I mentioned that there are other forms of treatment like the electroconvulsive therapy where the medications are not given directly to the patients, but it's a form of using an electrical card to help the patient in the management of the depression. So these are actually things that we do just in the, the general population. And it's also good for, I mean, during the people, for people who are pregnant who have um, depression and then during the postpartum period that's after delivery so psychological pharmacological and then the other treatments like the ECT wow I'm learning so so much okay so a lot of women are afraid to open up um, when they are not feeling themselves um, especially during pregnancy straight after giving birth what advice would you give to these women who they, they, they feel like mm, things are not right, but I'm not going to talk about it. I just want to keep it to myself. Okay, I'll say that it's, it's good for people if you have issues, okay? It's good for people to talk to somebody that they trust, okay? So if it's your, maybe your mother has come around after the maybe I know in, in 
society we do that a lot after the baby you either move to your mom's end or your your mother comes to you and you can confide in your mother it's good to tell your mother or a friend or whoever you are close to your husband to explain that this is what i'm going through and at the end of the day if there's a need to to seek help in the hospital then you have to do that because sometimes if you keep these things to yourself like i mentioned there are people who at the end of the day have um suicidal thoughts so ideally it's important for us that if you are having any of these symptoms that i've mentioned after delivery or during um, pregnancy it's important for you to um, confide in someone that you can trust and then if possible you can also come to the hospital okay. yourself okay, to seek medical help like i said you will be assessed you'll be listened to then the necessary medications or the necessary psychotherapy that you need would also be given to you so please don't keep to yourself try as much as possible to let somebody know or seek help in the hospital now when i mentioned that i would be having an interview with you um a few of my followers sent in questions so i'm gonna okay. um, there's about three or four questions that they sent in that i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you so one of my followers asked what is the difference between stress and depression? Okay, so I think for depression, I've mentioned that during this time, uh, patients have low mood mm -hmm. most of the day for almost, I mean, at least for a period of two weeks, you have the patients having low mood. Okay, um, for stress, stress can be physical, can be psychological, okay and these stress it, you are really there are things that at the end of the day overwhelm you so you are not able to cope with them okay you don't have any coping abilities for these kind of things that you do. so actually the stress can lead to depression right especially yes especially when you are not able to cope or the the situation whether it's a physical thing or an emotional thing overwhelms you so stress can actually lead to depression. Okay. Now, another question was, oh, well, the, the, the followers said, I often feel alone, taking care of the kids, trying to get back on my career path, but I don't want to talk about how I'm feeling and everything that I'm going through. What should I do? Okay, so you feel alone, but you are not alone. Okay, so let me calm this person down. Even though you feel alone, so I'll just urge you if there are people around, like I mentioned, for someone who has given birth and then you feel you're feeling sad, crying, and not all that, it's important for you to tell someone, okay, tell someone that it's around you, somebody that you can confide in. And then also, if you have to come to the hospital yourself, you can do that, and then seek help because it could be anything. Okay. Like I mentioned, things can get overboard, overwhelmed because the kids and in this COVID era where kids are not going to school, they are home with us, you might feel so overwhelmed with things. But if you discuss with other people what I mean, your situation is, you realize that somebody might have help, somebody might give you a helping hand, probably come around. And your husband can also help. So I think that the best thing is for us not to sit down and say, oh, I'm not going to talk to anybody, but try as much as possible to, to seek help. Another question was, um, I'm definitely, I definitely know I'm going through postpartum depression. My youngest is five months and I just don't feel right. I cry a lot. Sometimes I don't know why and my partner isn't understanding. How can I find my happiness again? Okay, so just like I've mentioned for the others, what you need to do at this point in time, especially when you have confided in somebody or you think that a person is not understanding you, it's important that you come to the hospital. And then what we also do is that not just you, I mean, mental health looks at, I mean, you in totality. So your family, everybody around you. So in as much as will help you to solve your problem whether through psychotherapy or medications we we'll also we have family therapy as well where we get your partner involved so that they will also understand 
the situation and then they can help you with okay and last during COVID-19 you mentioned that a lot of moms are feeling overwhelmed and watching the news doesn't help it stresses mothers out even more any little thing it's we're triggered oh my gosh is my kid okay oh he's feeling a bit warm today oh gosh he's a, a little cough oh gosh because i know even me <laughs> i'm done yes. any small thing i'm like every morning i'm like touching making sure he doesn't have a temperature when he sneezes i'm like why are you sneezing it's like <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's really getting to my head um so i know okay. other mothers must be experiencing the same thing what can a mother yeah. do to avoid falling into any type of depression, any type of sadness, um, and try not to feel like so paranoid about everything. Okay. So, I mean, in this COVID area, we are having a lot of news going around concerning the number of people who have infections and all that. So if you are feeling a bit anxious and all that, our advice that you should cut down on I mean, social media, media, basically what you are listening to, what you are watching. And then you know, sometimes WhatsApp information may be false and all that. You'll be tempted to actually follow those information that be, that's going around and say that, oh, okay, so this is what's happening. As much as possible, if you're anxious about these things, I'll just urge you to cut down on watching, I mean, getting yourself, I mean, people go, okay, so the numbers are now increasing and they are, they are, they are, they are feeling anxious and all that. If you're like that, I'll, I'll just urge you to cut down what you watch, what you listen to, and then the false news that's, that's going around. And just for everybody, empower yourself, okay, that say to yourself that even in this um, period where we're having challenges, there's a positive out of it. What can I do? With all the, the protocols that have been mentioned on how to protect ourselves, together with my children, okay, right now I'm in the house with my children. I think we can empower each other, teach my children hand washing, okay, the cough and sneezing etiquette, and then all that. And I'm sure that when we follow the necessary protocols, we win this battle. Yes. Dr. Winifred, thank you so, so much. I know you're very busy. So for you to take out any time, it, it means a lot to me. I'm very grateful. So thank you. And um, do you have any last words for um, our moms? Because, you know, modern day mom is all about empowering, uplifting mothers and, and reminding them that they got this. Like this journey, they have it. They yeah. shouldn't worry. Okay. So I want to come. All mothers, we celebrated Mother's Day mm -hmm. not too long ago. Just to come and tell them that you are not alone. Okay, you can do this. You can do this. Whatever thing that you are doing, if it's caring for the kids, caring for the home, you can do this. Okay. So I'll just say that um, a happy belated Mother's Day yeah. to all our mothers, yeah. and then continue to hold on to the things that we are going bit by bit. Everything will be fine. Thank you so much, Dr. Winifred. Thank you, thank you so much. Looking forward to meeting thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, yes.